Hey everybody, welcome back to Knitting Butterflies. My name is Emily. Thank you so much for joining me today um, on this episode of Knitting Butterflies. Today I'm going to talk about a lot of knitting. I've gotten a lot of objects finished recently and we're going to talk about spinning and Rhinebeck, which was awesome. I'm not going to do a full recap of my experience in Rhinebeck because, you know, all the almost all the cool podcasters have already done that and I'm sure that you all have heard what you needed to hear about the actual experience of Rhinebeck, but I have a, spe a few specific memories that are really unique to my experience that I just wanted to share. And then after that, we're finally going to do some photography talk. It has been way too long since we've talked photography, and I'm really, really excited. I have some awesome stuff to share with you, and we're going to go from there. So before we get started, I have my handy dandy bullet journal here. Um, to remind me of all the things to make sure and hit on because I have all of my notes and I didn't want to forget anything. I wanted to let you know about a couple things um, before we get started with all the knitting and things like that. There are a few new patterns out that I wanted to tell you about. Um, Kino Knits, who is Mary, has started or she has released another one of her pattern collaborations. So these are called Point Counterpoint. Um, and she teams up with another designer and one of them designs an item and then sends a picture of it to the other designer and then that designer designs an item to go with it. And I think that's really fun. So she has released her third collection from the point. counterpoint collection with Claire Devine and the patterns are called Eily and Big Fancy. Eily is the hat I think is what it's pronounced and Big Fancy is a really beautiful shawl and they go really nicely together and then Lolly Bella and Lamley are another hat and fingerless mitt set that go together so definitely check that out. It's $10 for that pattern set. Thank you so much for that Mary. I really appreciate it. Um, the other pattern that I wanted to just let you all know is called the Strange Brew Pattern by Tin Can Knits. This is, I, I can hardly stand it, I'm so excited about this pattern. Um, this is a pattern to design your own yoke sweater. It is the formula for stitch counts and everything and then almost a hundred different stitch patterns to put on the yoke of your sweater so that you can design your own sweater pattern using the yoke. Pat, using the yoke formula. And I am giddy with excitement over this because I have been wanting to figure out how in the world I'm gonna do my hand spun sweater because I wanted to make it a yoked sweater and it's not the, the size of yarn of the pattern that I wanted to make. And now I can totally take that um, stitch pattern and put it onto a yoke sweater using the Tin Can Knits um, pattern. And it includes um, graph paper so you can chart out your pattern and everything. And oh my gosh, it's going to be amazing. It also includes a hat pattern and a cowl pattern that you can use as smart swatches so that you can see what your project will look like and still get a finished object out of it instead of having to just do a swatch and then you're done. So I thought that was super smart and the pattern's only $7. So thank you so much Tin Can Knits for sending this to me. I am definitely going to be using this in the very near future and for sure check it out. I also wanted to let you know that Christy from the Innocent Knit Podcast who was formerly video. Is Hi, now I'm Christy, host of the Innocent Knit Podcast where I talk about knitting, spinning, and more. We're getting ready to wrap up our baseball season batter up, Cal, and are starting a sweater series where I talk about picking styles that are right for you, modifying patterns, and knitting our way through sweaters we choose. Past video episodes are available on YouTube and iTunes, and current audio episodes are available through any podcast aggregator, including iTunes and Google Play. Find me on the web at www.innocentknit.com. So if you haven't subscribed to her on iTunes, definitely do that. Her first couple episodes are really, really interesting. Um, 
and her latest one she talks about measurements and how to adjust the armhole length in your sweaters and she's a very smart and super sweet person and I really like the audio format with her new podcast so definitely check that out so the first finished object that I wanted to show you is my pair of hand spun mitts these are all done and I love them so much um these are knit out of the electric bugaloo colorway that into the world sent for its July yarn club or fiber club and um I really love them I think they turned out really good I've been wearing them like crazy and so they're actually pilling a lot because I've been wearing them so much but they turned out amazing um I did use a pattern for this but I I didn't I Pretty much the only thing in the pattern that I used was the stitch counts to start and finish. Everything else I did based off of other patterns that I have used. Um, the thumb gusset I used from the Waiting for Winter mitts by Susan B. Anderson. And because um, I didn't like how the thumb gusset was constructed in the hand spun mitts pattern. So um, that was what I did for that. They turned out so great and I wear them all the time. Like this is what I have been wanting. And so I made these for Rhineback because I knew it was going to be really, well, I thought it was going to be really cold. And last year I was wishing so bad that I had a pair of hand spun mitts. I had hand spun mitt envy from my friend Michelle who had a pair. And I was just like, oh, that's so smart. I should really knit a pair. And I don't knit a lot of small projects. I like really big projects. And so it's just not ever something that's crossed my mind. And it turned out amazing. I love this like one little pop of pink. And, um, they go with my Diana hat that I knit, which is currently, I'm not sure where it is. So once I find it, um, I'll be able to put together the entire, a video of the entire process of this particular fiber from when I got it in the mail until all the finished object of it. So you can see the entire progression, how I separated the colors, how I applied it, how I decided what to knit with it and then go from there. So yay, those are done. And I wear them, like I said, I wear them all the time, especially when I'm driving. They're perfect, they're perfect. So hand spun mitts I think are my new favorite thing and I might have to knit a few pairs for Christmas because they are lovely. Um, I have another finished object that I can, again, I'm just not an organized person and so I have some missing stuff. But I did finish the pair of socks from my Fall Betty Sock Blank. This is by, the yarn was by um, Roundabout Yarn, who is Terry, who I got to see at Rhinebeck, which was exciting. Terry and I have met at a few different events now. And um, so this is the second sock. So they are done completely. I love them. Um, it's funny because I was originally knitting this sock on, um, clover needles, which, and just size ones, clover needles. And I could not figure out why I hated taking these out all the time. It was because the needles were terrible. The cord on the clover needles is awful. It keeps like getting wound up. And especially with a sock blink, if you have an end hanging out or even not an end hanging out, just like the little squiggly, um, that the sock blank leaves was getting tangled up every single time I pulled it out of the bag. And so that explained why I was dreading pulling it out of the bag all the time. I, um, found a pair of my size one chow goo needles and started working on it again. And I loved it. It just flew like crazy. And I finished it in the car on the road to Rhineback. So that was very, very exciting. Um, so that pair is done. Once I find the other sock, I'll be sure to take a picture of it. So, um, but I, I did bring other sock yarn to Rhinebeck and I don't know why I did that because hello, we were going to a yarn festival. And of course I was going to find something that I wanted to cast on right away, which is exactly what happened. I picked up a sock blank. So what I'm not going to do in this episode is do like a show of all of my purchases. Um, but I am going to show you what I am working on. And so I purchased a sock blank from Andre Sue Knits, which I have been coveting this sock blank since she opened her shop. Like I wanted one so bad. And every time I would miss the update or I just didn't have the money in the bank account or things like that. And I got one at Needles Up and it is so perfect for me. Look at this. It's butterflies. <gasps> I love it. 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 Love it. It's amazing. I kind of want to email her and ask if she would make me one that's like turquoise and grays. 
kind of like my logo. I don't know. But isn't it beautiful? And you can tell this used to have four butterflies on it and I'm already down to two. I am hoping, 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 hoping that I have enough yarn left over from this to save a whole butterfly. And I think I will because if I do, I'm totally framing this and putting it in my craft room because it's just so special and pretty. And I don't want to lose that. So that's the goal is to have enough yarn to save a whole butterfly, which I'm pretty sure that I will. Um, I have already, I cast this on with my friend Jen. She was knitting her Andre Sunit's sock blank. And so we sat there wearing the scarves um, while we were waiting in line at Indie Untangled. And I cast on my first sock and I have already finished it. Again, I love it. I love it. So I love that I can tell kind of the story of where this is in the sock blank. I think that's so fun. So you have like just the plain blue and then you have the wings and it starts to fade into the orange and the yellow. And then this little bit right here is where the body of the butterfly is. It was like a gray and turquoisey color right here. And then you start yellow and then go back out. So let's see if I can show it at the same time. Do you see it now? Can you see both parts of it? Like, I feel like it's a story that it's telling. And so it's so much fun to knit because I would get to the yellow and I'd be like, oh, I know right where this is in the sock blank and then just keep going and going. And then I have a space between the butterflies. And so um, this is why I'm pretty sure I'm gonna have enough yarn to save a whole butterfly because there were four. This is all one butterfly right here. And then this is the start of the second. And then I have my second sock that I have started and I am working on, so this is the first bit of yellow, and then this is where the body of the butterfly is, and then yellow, orange, and then I'm heading to red right here. So, um, and then I'm gonna have a big old spot of blue in there too. So I am like 90% sure that I'm gonna have enough yarn to have a butterfly left over, which is so awesome. So I love this sock, I love this sock blank. I feel like it was a great, project to have while I was gone and all that stuff. So hooray for that. So that, um, that is halfway done. I have another finished object though to show you. And this is massive. Um, I did not think I was going to even finish this project at all. I honestly thought I was going to frog it. And, um, after watching my last podcast, I realized it was really beautiful and I didn't want to frog it after all. So I finished my What the Fade shawl. I don't even think I can fit it all in the frame. Nope, but that's okay. Look at that. This thing is massive. It is so big, but look at how beautifully it faded. I love it. And then I really wanna show you the wrong side because I almost like the wrong side better. Actually, I think I do like the wrong side better. That's okay, right? I just like my colors. Look at that, it's so beautiful. Oh my gosh. So, this is a pattern by Andrea Mowry. This was a mystery knit along, all the clues are out, obviously. Um, I have not washed or blocked this yet and I am planning on making tassels for it eventually. My husband always jokes about the tassels, but that's okay. So I think it definitely needs tassels, but this shawl is huge and I haven't washed it or blocked it yet because I keep wearing it. I keep taking it places and I, so truth time, right? I have a really, really hard time sharing knitting with non knitters, if that makes any sense, because I have some people in my life whom I love dearly that kind of give me a hard time about it, you know? Like, oh, you're going to another knitting event. Of course you are. Or, um, you know, the, the age old, you should sell that. Or like, you know, you should set up a stand outside and put your knitting out for sale. And it was like, really? It's just not, I don't even know. Like, it's not that they're not supportive. It's just that, I don't know. I kind of feel like that high schooler who has like, who's almost getting made fun of again. And so this project, I love it. And I was like, I even told my husband, I was like, I'm not gonna wear this in public, honestly, because non-knitters just aren't going to get it, right? It's this giant, 
It's this giant shawl with all these crazy colors in it. And non-knitters are just not going to get it. And I'm going to get all these weird questions. And it's just going to kind of be a thing, right? And my husband was like, well, that's fine. And my thought was when I was knitting it, I could have this to just like hang around in my house and wrap up. It's like a blanket. Like seriously, when I get cold, I just wrap up in it like a blanket. I just put it over my shoulders and sit and watch TV. Or I even like wanted to wear it to bed one time, which how do you wear a shawl to bed? But I just kind of wanted to just, you know, like this is very hugga right here, you know? And so I just, that was what I wanted it for. And then the day after I finished it, I finished it at like 1130 at night. And then the next day I went and ran errands and totally took it with me because I was like, I'm going to wear this. This is going to be awesome. I'm going to feel great. And I did. And it was, it was so wonderful to have this. I couldn't, I just, um, so I love the fade progression. I love, I love almost all of my color choices. If I did it again, I would have chosen a different color A. Um, and I'm okay with that. And I actually thought about like putting in a lifeline before I would fade in the last color. And then if I didn't like it, just rip it out. But then the more I thought about it, the more I was like, color A is right in the beginning. It needs something to balance it out. Otherwise, it's just gonna look strange. So um, this color is Western Sky Knits. Um, I don't remember the name of the colorway, but I love it by itself. But when I faded it with the purples, it just didn't go. And so um, I feel like everything else is really cool toned. And then there's like these pops of gold in the very beginning, which I feel like looks out of place a little bit, but I'm okay with it. I'm over it. It doesn't matter. And I think it looks fine at the bottom. So I love it. Like... And I'm really proud of myself for finishing it. Like I sat down and finished it. And I, as I was binding off, it took me like an hour and a half to bind it off. It took forever. And my husband was just laughing at me because I just sat there over and over saying, I can't believe I did it. I can't believe I did it. Like this pattern is so big. I didn't think I would finish it. And I'm just sitting here telling myself, this is six gains of yarn. Think of all the things that you could cast on from Rhineback if you would just finish it. And that's what I made myself do. I had all these projects that I wanted to work on from Ryan Beck and yeah. So, um, I'll go over the yarns with you really fast. Color A is Western Sky Knits. Color B is One Twisted Tree here. It might be better if I do it from this direction. So color A, Western Sky Knits. Color B, is One Twisted Tree, Rare Woman Claire. Color C is Cascade Heritage. It's weird that I stuck a solid in there. Maybe not the best choice, but I think it turned out fine. Um, so that's Cascade Heritage Sock. Color D is Madeline Tosh. This is a singles yarn, so it's my only singles yarn in this group. Color E, this one right here is um, a Loops. And then color F is Lolo Did It. So six skeins of yarn and it's done. I did not use even close to all of some of the colors, including the color F Lolo did it. Um, so I have a bunch of that left over, which makes me happy. And I'm going to have to make some other stuff out of this. Yay. That's done. So what the fade done. My motivation for getting that done was because I bought a couple of sweater quantities when I was at Rhinebeck. Um, this one I'm super excited about. And I actually cast on the sweater last night. So this is yarn by Cozy Color Works. And this color is called Cookies and Cream. Um, this was one of the only speckled yarn booths that we saw at actual the actual New York Sheep and Wolf Festival. There was a lot of really beautiful speckled yarn at Indian Untangled and it needles up and things, but I wasn't quite ready to go buy a whole sweater from anybody yet because I wasn't sure what I was gonna find. So I bought this on the last day. So this is Cookies and Cream and I am starting a so faded sweater. So obviously that's not the first color. I'm only a couple rows in. I did do a swatch and I actually did a couple swatches of this. This yarn 
um, was really fine by itself. It is a really light fingering weight yarn and it's only a two ply. And this yarn is a very light two ply. And while I love this sweater, it is somewhat transparent, which means I always have to wear a tank top underneath it. And so um, I wanted a thicker fabric for this sweater. And so I'm actually holding the yarn double. I did not get gauge with the pattern. So I went ahead and sat down and did the math and figured out that if I knit the, I have a size 34 bust, that if I knit the size 34 bust with the gauge that I have, I will have a sweater that is 36.9 inches around, which sounds very comfortable to me about, um, uh, right about three inches of positive ease, which means it'll be a nice sweater. I can throw it over a t-shirt or tank top if I want, or I can wear it by itself. It's super soft. It's super wash merino. I was worried also that it would pill like crazy um, if I just held it single. And so I feel like I kind of overcame the issues that I was worried about having with this yarn by just holding it double. Gauge was still really close, knitting it on size fives. And then my row gauge was exactly perfect. So I have cookies and cream, which will fade into this gray right here, which is called Smoky Mountain. And it has some hints of purple that aren't reading in there. So it'll be this to this to, ah, oh my, this might be a tangled mess for a minute, to this one. This is called Midnight Aubergine. I think it has the word aubergine in it somewhere. And then it's going to end with this one. And I don't remember the name of this one, but I'll put them all down. So see if I can do this without dropping anything. These are also big skeins. They're 580 yards. Um, and the tag was a little confusing. It said between 3.5 and 4.5 ounces, approximately 580 yards. I don't understand that, but okay. I don't understand how you can estimate a whole ounce, but hey, it works. So there's my four colors that I'm going to be fading. And I'm super excited because since I'm holding the yarn double, I get to play with how I'm going to fade this a little bit more than your typical, you know, every other row striping that's in the pattern. I'm so excited. Um, I did not do a swatch of this, but I did sit down. I tried doing the normal, what I thought was the normal fade progression. And then I actually read the pattern and that's not how you're supposed to fade. Um, but that's okay. But I did do a swatch to see what the colors would look like. I didn't actually finish the swatch because I got bored. Um, but there's the white to gray to purple to red. And I think it's going to be really pretty in the whites on the top. And then it's a top down sweater. So it will end with red on the bottom. And um, this is really pretty by itself. The two rows of each is too big. Um, I wanted it to be a little bit more delicate and melty and that's not how you're supposed to fade anyway. So once I figured that out, I was like, oh, well, duh. Of course I need to do it correctly according to the pattern. So, um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to play with holding once I'm ready to start fading in the gray from the white, I'll hold one strand of white and one strand of gray and then two strands of white and then two together and then like kind of go back and forth. So that hopefully it will create this really beautiful melted fade progression. It's going to be so pretty. Oh my gosh. I'm like freaking out. It's going to be amazing. So that is my project that I'm working on right now um, that I just cast on last night. And we will see how that goes. This is going to be a mess, but that's okay. So I have been doing some spinning. I loved doing spinzilla but i didn't finish my fleece and so i sometimes feel like pulling out my spinning wheel um obviously it hasn't been as much as it was during spinzilla but i have been spinning some and so i wanted to show you that i have gotten i actually have four more bobbins of my fleece that i have spun up this is a really beautiful chocolate brown cormo that i bought um from rhinebeck last year i have a fourth bobbin that's still on my wheel i just haven't um, pulled it off, but it is finished. And so I'm hoping to um, finish spinning singles from that Cormo 
that I have. I did purchase two pounds of it, and at this point I've spent well over a pound of it. I think I can get, so three of these bobbins will make a full skein, maybe a little bit more. I'm not really sure. I'm hoping to get at least three more full skeins of yarn from the fleece that I still have left over. And then I actually have another six ounces, I think, of white Cormel from that same place. And so um, these will eventually be my hand spun sweater. And I wanted to do all natural color. So the brown is gonna be the body of the sweater. And then the white is going to be the detail on the yoke of the sweater. So this will be my hand spun yoked sweater someday. I don't know when that's gonna happen. Probably not till after Christmas, but I do enjoy spinning it a lot and it's just a good project when I just feel like listening to an audiobook for a while and spinning or um, dinner is cooking in the instant pot and just watching the kids and things like that. And so it's been really lovely to spin on. So that is where I am at with that particular project. Um, funny note, the Christy Glass YouTube channel, which if you don't watch it already, definitely check her out. She's super sweet and she was at Rhinebeck this year, but she did an interview where she went to Blackberry Hills Farm and I was watching it and I was like, I think that's where I bought my fleece from. I think that's where I bought my Cormo, well, it's not fleece, roving, where I bought my Cormo roving from. And sure enough, they show the balls of Cormo roving that they sell and that was exactly where I bought mine. And so um, I actually sent Christy a message on Instagram and said, I think I might have Oprah's yarn. So how fun is that? Um, so Blackberry Hills Farm, it's really nice to spin the, it's really nice to spin, especially long draw. I think I would get a little bit frustrated if I was trying to spin it um, fully worsted, just because it's, it's definitely prepped in a way that was made for long draw. I'll put it that way. The fibers are not all lined up. If I was gonna do, um, if I was gonna take this roving and turn it into combed top, then I think I could definitely do worsted where it's really tight and really fine and very consistent, but I kind of like the thick and thin that I get out of this. And there's definitely still some vegetable matter in there. I pull out what I can, um, but this is from a lamb and lambs are dirty little creatures. They roll around in the hay and the grass all the time. So I often will have a pile sitting right here of like all the stuff that's left over from this little lamb and it's roving. So I think it's turning out super nice and it's a fun project. So that will just keep going whenever I feel like spinning. I haven't been really motivated to spin any colored fiber yet. I bought a bunch of fiber at Rhinebeck. And um, again, this is kind of hanging over my head that I really want to get this done. And so I think once I get this done, then I can really jump on getting some of the stuff spun up that I bought at Rhinebeck. So um, that is all for spinning. I wanted to take a little bit of time and just talk about my favorite memories of Rhinebeck with you guys. Um, like I said, we're not going to do a full recap of my total experience with Rhinebeck, but I did want to say thank you to Boston Jen for hosting me. Um, I flew into Boston and um, stayed at her house that first night on Thursday. And then she put together the hotel. She did all the driving. She was amazing. She was an amazing hostess. And I really, really appreciate everything that she did for me and for all of her friends. And we had a really good time. Um, this time, I we didn't get to go with all of our other knitting friends that we see normally and that we talk to between me and Jen, which was fine. Like, I missed having them there, but it also gave me a chance to get to know Jen's friends a lot better this year, and I'm pretty sure her friend Nikki is like my soul sister. So that's kind of fun that I got to make some really cool new friends and got to know them a lot better this time, and we had a good time together. So um, I have just a few memories written down from my experience at Rhinebeck that were my favorite. First of all, and I told this story to so many people because it was like the most amazing thing I've ever seen. I didn't get it on video because I wasn't expecting this at all, but it was so cool. Flying into Boston, we flew out over the ocean and then we turned around, we flew back into shore. Um, the ocean's kind of a big deal for me, just so you all know, because I am from a landlocked area in Colorado. And so the idea that you can see water that just doesn't end is mind blowing to me. And so we were flying into shore over the ocean and I was sitting in the middle seat, not on the window seat, but I was kind of watching out the window over the lady and I looked down and there were three whales swimming in the ocean. Did you know that they do that? It was 
awesome. And I kind of freaked out and like put my arm over her and I was like, there's things swimming down there. And she looked and she was like, oh my gosh, it was so cool. And um, I use the app Marco Polo to send videos to different people and stuff, which is a really fun app. It's like Snapchat, but you can do longer and you can send it just to specific people. So um, I sent a Marco Polo to my family after I got off the plane and I was like, oh my gosh, I just saw three whales swimming in the ocean while I was flying in. And of course my daughter sends me one back and she goes, um, can you take pictures of them next time you see them? Because I want to see them too. And I talked to several people about it and nobody else had ever seen anything like this. So I was like, this is not a normal thing, sweetie. So um, I did find a whale in the airport gift shop on my way home and like a stuffed animal whale. And I did bring her that home since I couldn't bring her back pictures. So that was something fun. Um, Jen picked me up and then we went straight from the airport into, I don't even know where she lives. I know what town she lives in, but I know that her family doesn't live in that same town. But we went to a photo shoot immediately from there. So I was able to go out because Jen um, hired me to do a photo shoot for her family while I was out there, which was really generous of her. I haven't shot in a long time. And um, I'm definitely still getting my practice back in on family sessions, but it went so well. I rented a camera and I'll talk about that in a little bit, but my camera, my camera is broken. Um, I am currently looking at having it fixed so that I can use it to eventually upgrade into a nicer camera. But I rented a camera for our photo shoot. Um, I rented a 50 millimeter lens as well, and we didn't end up using it at all, which was totally fine. It was like $17 to rent it. It wasn't a big deal. Um, but I did bring my big lens, my 18 to 200 millimeter lens. And we were racing the light because my flight was delayed by, I think, an hour which brought us in, I think we started shooting at like five o'clock, which at home is no big deal. In Colorado, that's no big deal. You can shoot even in this time of year um, until the time change happens up until like six o'clock. You know, it's usually an hour before sunset, but there are so many trees in this part of the country that even when the sun was still up, we had not very much light at all because the trees provided so much shade. And so we were racing, racing, racing the light. We were running as fast as we could to get to where we wanted to do these photos to race the light. And um, I hate to say it, some of the photos ended up super grainy because the light was just so bad at that point. I should have been prepared and brought a flash. That was my bad. So that was my, completely my bad. Um, it would have been an off-camera flash. I possibly would have needed two of them though because we had so many people on the photo shoot. We did a shoot for Jen and her partner Dan and then her parents and brother and sister-in-law and then their kids. Um, so I actually probably would have needed two flashes to accommodate that many people to make it even across everybody's faces so that one person wouldn't have been blown out while other people would have been dark. So, um, but they still turned out well. And then we went to a spot where the sun was kind of shining in and normally you don't want to shoot with direct sunlight in people's faces, but the place where we were made it perfect. The light was perfect on them. And those shots turned out so much better. Um, and so once I saw those, as I was editing photos, I kind of went, okay, phew. Like we have really, really, really good photos to turn in. We have good photos that will still be fine once they're in a print. They're fine, but they're not exceptionally great. And that was what I wanted. And I feel like we got those once we got with the sun in their faces. So we did the photo shoot and that was awesome. Um, and then we, um, I stayed at Jen's house. Sorry, I'm, I shouldn't do the whole recap. Um, just pick a few memories, but we did drive with Jen's friends, which was awesome. Like I said, Nikki is my soul sister. We talked a lot about books and movies and music. She's obsessed with Hamilton, just like me, which was awesome. Um, and then her other friends, Melissa and Ryan and Amy were all amazing. We had such a good time together in the hotel and everything. We drove Friday morning to Needles Up. Needles Up was so much fun. Sue and Andy, Sue from Legacy Fiber Arts and Andy from Andre Sue Knits 
well done. This event was executed amazingly. We showed up so much earlier than we had planned. We hoped they could get there like 3.30 and we're like, oh, there's gonna be 200 people in line. And then we showed up at 1.30 because traffic was really great. And we were like the second group. And so Jen and I had brought camping chairs from their kayaking trip and we parked ourselves in our camping chairs and sat there for a while. Needles Up was awesome. Um, they only let 60 people in at a time, which was so perfect because it was enough that you could talk with people, but you could still shop. It wasn't crazy crowded. I, we were probably in and out in 10 minutes. We went in, I found all my stuff. I knew exactly what I wanted, said hi, got pictures with people and left and we were done. They had a lot of people, excuse me, they had a lot of people in line and I talked to some of the people who were at the end of the line the next day. Everybody got in, everybody got what they wanted. They had plenty of stock for everybody. Well done. Um, my not favorite memory was Indie Untangled. I have to say, um, we again showed up really early. It was so crowded. It was miserable shopping in that place. Um, but the good news is that I know of some people who have emailed the coordinator of Indie Untangled and said, this space is not big enough to host this event. She has listened and hopefully it will be fixed next year. If not, I'm kind of okay with skipping it. I did buy some yarn from Hugh Loco, which I wasn't expecting to get. One, because she's local to me. And so I figured I can get it from at least two of my local yarn stores that I know of that carry her yarn. So I figured I'm not gonna even bother going into the booth because I know I can get her stuff locally. And um, I was looking what I thought was the booth next to hers and I found this awesome um, backyard chicken set and I looked at it and it said Hugh Loco and I loved it and I just went over and paid for it. So that was really fun actually that I got to buy some of Nicole's yarn um, from Indian Tangled and I did buy a couple other little things that I knew I was getting but after I was done, I was done. I bought the two things that I wanted and I was done shopping. I didn't want to look in the other booths. I didn't want to um, feel like I was getting trampled all the time. So Indian Tangled was not what I had hoped it would be, especially after attending Needles Up right before when it was so awesome. So, um, but that's okay. Another favorite memory was having people sign my book. So like I said, I have my bullet journal. I am fairly new to bullet journaling. Um, and I love it. I think I'm four or five months in. And one thing that I did, I got this idea from Paula from Knitting Pipeline. When she and I have met at lots of different events and I adore her. Um, and she always carries around a notebook. And if you talk to her, she has you sign her notebook. And so then she goes through and she lists all the people who sign her notebook on her podcast. Well, last year, Rhinebeck felt like Disneyland to me because Everywhere I turned, it was, oh my gosh, look who's over there. Oh my gosh, look, it's the yarn harlot. It's it's Amy Herzog. It's this and this and this and this. And sometimes I got to have pictures with people and sometimes I just said hi and sometimes I got really nervous. And I am an extrovert, but I get really nervous that first interaction, especially if it's somebody that I'm really familiar with and they have no idea who I am. Um, by the way, having the fat squirrel recognize me and talked to me a lot more and she gave me a hug and took a picture. That was like super big highlight for me. But when I was a kid and I went to Disneyland, my parents gave me the little autograph book so that I would have something to go up and ask all of the characters for to sign my autograph book. And this year I wanted to treat it like Disneyland. So I made a special page in my bullet journal called things that people to remember at Rhinebeck. And I had so many of you guys sign my book. Look at this. So I actually took a marker later and I wrote Rhinebeck underneath it just so it'd be pretty. Um, and at first people were kind of signing, you know, in like this, except for Christy Glass, cause she's Christy Glass, love that about her. And then we just ran out of room. So people just started sticking in their signatures anywhere they could fit it. And it is reading backwards for me right now. Hopefully it was flipped for you in the final video, but, um, it was amazing. It was so much fun. And I felt really bad that I ran out of room the first day. And so I decided to make another page for the second day. And I didn't see nearly as many people the second day. The first day was the podcaster meetup and things like that. And so there was a lot more opportunity for me to um, have people to sign it. I tried really hard not just to have like the other podcasters that I watched, but anybody who pretty much would talk to me, honestly. I had a lot of people come up and say hi that are watchers of the podcast and 
at the podcaster meetup, they totally made my day. Um, because I have not been very consistent with keeping up with this podcast to have people come up and give me a hug and say, we love watching your podcast really made my day. And so I had all of them sign. I mean, everybody, like so many people sign my pod or my bullet journal that I actually started another page and I filled up this whole side and then I had this whole side that was blank and so on the flight home I just sat and I wrote out everything that happened to Ryan Beck and kind of kept it like treated it like a journal so there's all the things to remember about Ryan Beck with more of the signatures and this was a really really fun it was a really fun icebreaker because I felt like I could go up and be like will you sign my book for me please and everybody loved the concept behind it and now I have this really cool notebook to keep with all of my memories of you guys. So thank you. If you signed my book, thank you. I really appreciate it. So that was a super, super fun and it gave me something to do. You know, I was like, oh, I still haven't seen this person. I really want to go see this person because I want them to sign my book. So that was a fun way to keep, to keep me going throughout the day. Um, let's see other fun memories. Oh, on Sunday. So on Saturday, I got to see my wonderful and amazing friend Candy from Pause for Stitches and her husband, Jamie. She was with Jen from the Jen Chilin podcast. And um, I know she came up with a couple other of her friends, but they had migrated away for a while. Um, but Candy and I talk a lot on Marco Polo. And we saw each other last year, but this year I could hardly wait to see her. And I just, I almost started crying when I saw her. Um, I was so happy, so, 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 so happy to see her in person and to get to talk to Jamie. And it was that very familiar, like, we're already friends. We don't even have to do the whole, like, small talk kind of thing. We're already friends. Let's just go hang out together. And so Sunday, I actually broke away from my group of friends that I came with. And I hung out with Candy and Jamie, just the three of us for a while, which was one of the highlights of my weekend. Um, we talked New Jersey, we talked meatballs, we talked New York, we talked Colorado breweries, we talked hiking, we talked all different kinds of stuff. We picked out a, um, a sweater vest for Jamie that was really cool and it was so much fun. So I want to go visit them so bad in New Jersey and they said it's really easy to get into New York City from there, which is on my bucket list to visit. And so that was a huge part of my weekend. So Candy... I love you and it was so fun hanging out with you. Um, one of my really fun things was that I did not really get sick this time. I have a really bad habit of not eating well and eating a bunch of fair food and then getting sick for the whole rest of the time that I'm at events like this. This happened really, really bad on Saturday last year. Um, this year I did kind of get sick on Friday because I wasn't eating enough. Um, but Boston Jen helped me so much and she um, has done Weight Watchers and I'm doing Weight Watchers right now, which I'm not going to get into on the podcast, but she was a huge help to me in finding food that was good for me to carry around easily in my bag so that when I started to get hunger pains, I could just eat an apple or some cheese or um, some Bella Vita crackers or whatever. And it kept me going. It saved me money because I didn't waste a whole bunch of, or not waste, I didn't spend a whole bunch of money on fair food. And last year, I'm pretty sure I got sick because I ate funnel cake for lunch. This year, the only things I had were like amazing and so worth the wait and worth the money and not eaten just because I needed something to eat. And so it was really, really nice not feeling sick the whole time. I did have an apple cider donut. Thank you, Ryan, for getting that for me. Oh, those things are so heavenly. Um, and I also got fries with cheese sauce on Sunday, but I also had an apple and a granola bar and stuff like that. So it was, it was a really good day of moderation in fair food, which led to my body feeling so much better this time around. So I do appreciate that. The day after, so Monday was the day I had to fly back. And so Jen drove me into Boston and we dropped off Nikki and Amy earlier for their flight. And my husband kept saying, you're so lucky you get to go to Boston. If I was there, I would get a cannoli. And so we kind of devised a plan to go get him a cannoli. Um, and we were at the bakery at like 8 o'clock in the morning. And so 
we had grabbed breakfast before we went to Hanover or um, the street we're on was Hanover Street, which I guess is kind of a big deal. I don't know Boston that well. I know we got to see Paul Revere's house, which was kind of cool. Um, but we ate breakfast at this place that she really likes and it was good. It was a good omelet. And then we went to um, the bakery. I don't even remember the bakery's name. It's not Mike's. It's the other one. I'm sure she'll tell me what it is. But we did buy my husband a cannoli. And then I had to figure out how to get a cannoli safely from Boston to Colorado. Which worked. I, it survived. It made it the whole way there. Um, after a 14-hour travel day, though, it wasn't quite as fresh as, you know, if he had had it at the bakery. And so he was so sweet. He was very touched that we really, really, really tried and he took one bite and said it was delicious and then said he couldn't eat any more because he was like, there's definitely a little bit of a sour taste in the ricotta. And so he didn't want to get sick. So he ate one bite and he really enjoyed that one bite, which he also appreciated how thoughtful it was. So um, I really appreciate, again, Jen for helping me do that with him. Um, so overall, Rhinebeck was an amazing experience. I actually hope to go again at least one more time. I do feel like it was worth going a second time because this time I knew where everything was, who was there, what I wanted to get, and it was great. So that was Rhinebeck for me. Um, I wanted to do a little bit of photography talk with you, hopefully to wrap up because we are ending pretty long on this podcast right now. So, um, like I said, I rented a camera for Jen's photo shoot and actually the previous week I had somebody message me. Um, I am part of a group of women, female or women, female of female photographers in my area that all try to help each other out. And we've done projects together and photo shoots together and things like that. <coughs> so this person knew me from that group and she said, Hey, I have in-laws coming into town in three days, would you be available for a photo session? And I said, well, I don't have a camera that works right now, sorry. And she goes, perfect, that means you're available because everybody else is booked that has a camera that's working and that's working on family sessions this time of year. So she had a camera that she let me borrow. And so she let me borrow her Canon 5D Mark III with her 24 to 70 millimeter lens, which is a $5,000 rig. So that was intimidating. Um, she let me use it, but it was intimidating, but it went really, really well. And I had to, I actually shoot Nikon, so I didn't know where anything was. So real quick, I had to like be like, all right, how do I change shutter aperture and ISO? Just tell me how to do that and I can handle it from there. And so she did show me how to do that. And so um, I did her photo session and it went really well. And then I did Jen's photo session with the camera that I had rented. And it went really well. These sessions went so well that when I came home and sat down and edited them, I had to take a minute and just calm myself down. I actually started crying in front of my in front of my computer because I miss photography. I stopped working my business really hard um, a couple years ago when I got sick and had to have surgery, and we knew the recovery from the surgery was going to be really difficult emotionally. And mentally and it was um, and so I know that was the right call and then after that I ended up going back to work because I was so depressed staying at home and I didn't want to work for myself I wanted to go work for somebody else I wanted somebody else telling me what to do and paying me regularly and not having to deal with a lot of the stresses of running my own business and so I have not been shooting photography for money for almost two years Actually, we're right at about two years. So sitting down and doing it again. I mean, I've done a few things here and there. And I've still done um, volunteer work and charity work and things like that. But not the hustle with the websites and the galleries and everything. And um, I started crying in front of my computer because I realized how badly I loved it and missed it. It was such a huge part of me. Um, I was worried that it would be really difficult to go back in with confidence to remember what settings I needed to change to get what I wanted it, what I wanted each photo to look like and posing people and getting the kids to laugh and smile. And it wasn't hard at all. I, it was like, I mean, I know it's cliche to sound, to say it, but it was like riding a bike. I 
got up and I felt like I was in total control of the situation. I knew exactly how I wanted to build things. I knew who needed to sit where. I knew where I wanted to shoot. I knew what the light was doing. It was amazing. And the photos that I got turned out really beautiful. Um, the one for the other photographer, she messaged me and she was like, these are stunning. Thank you. Which was so encouraging to have her say that because she has a she is an amazing photographer. I stalked her after that to see what her work looked like um, before I turned into my session. And she was really, really pleased with how well they turned out. Um, and Jen was super thrilled with hers too. There was actually one shot that I'm going to put in at the very end that I am considering entering into some contests because I feel like it turned out so nice. And um, I would love to get like a huge print of it and entered into some competitions or something locally, like, like fair kind of stuff, you know, just to get going again. Um, so at this point I have some brainstorming that I am doing a whole lot on how in the world am I going to start shooting again and doing this. And I have a lot more knowledge now on SEO and websites and marketing and things like that than I did even when I, um, was shooting before, because I did a lot of that stuff for, bridal shop that I was working at. And I feel like I could do a really good job. So I, where I'm at currently, this is the, just kind of where I'm at right now. Um, I am working really hard on researching stuff on, I've already built a prototype website for my new website that I hope to go up pretty soon. Um, I need to renew my business license. I need to do all of like the behind the scenes stuff and um, hopefully get my camera repaired. That I need to get the quote from Nikon on how much that will cost to do that. Basically what happened was um, I had a lens that got sand in it because that happens. I, I lay on the ground a lot when I shoot and it got some sand in it and I my husband and I actually took it completely apart, cleaned it out, put it back together, worked great. Um, and in a Nikon camera, the motor to focus the lens is in the camera itself, not in the lens. Well, I think some of the sand from that lens got into the motor, into the focus motor of my camera, and it broke the focus motor. So it can't autofocus by itself. And now it's to the point where um, when you hold the shutter halfway down, when you're looking through a viewfinder and you hold the shutter halfway down, and you manually focus whatever spot you are focusing on, a little green light will pop up. Now the little green light isn't registering if things are in focus anymore. So I can't tell if things are in focus. The viewfinder is too small to be able to see for sure what's in focus. And so my shots are not turning out sharp anymore. So I need to send in my camera to Nikon to get it repaired. I think that's what I'm going to do to get started again. And I actually have a goal to upgrade myself to a full frame camera, um, which I'll go in another episode of what the differences are, but I have the camera picked out and I have the lens picked out that I would like to eventually get someday after that. But I have it in my bullet journal um, and I did a little goal setting in here and I'm just you can research the price if you want, but I don't really feel comfortable putting prices up here, but I have in my bullet journal that I am setting the goal and um, for the camera and for the lens. The camera I want is the Nikon D750, which is the, um, it's a full frame camera that for some, it doesn't quite have the fully metal body. Um, it's kind of a hybrid between plastic and carbon fiber, and that makes it considerably less expensive, but the reviews on it are really great. It's a Nikon, so I know where everything is. And um, and the price point is about half of what the Mark, the Canon 5D Mark III that I borrowed was. So, um, or the next step up, which is the Nikon D810. I'm not sure where they are in their lineup right now. Two years ago when I was looking, it was the D810, which was about $3,400. So, <laughs> I don't want to spend five grand on photography. I feel like that's more for people who are doing wedding photography, who are shooting every single weekend, who are shooting for eight hours a day, things like that. That's just not who I am. Um, mine is more family photography and things like that. But I did notice the difference between using the full frame and using the 
crop frame, I notice the difference in the picture quality and the low light quality and things like that. And so I definitely know I want to eventually get into the full frame camera. So the D750 is my ultimate goal. And then um, if I'm able to achieve that, then I would really like to get the Nikon version of the 24 to 70 f2.8 lens. Um, this is a really great lens for family photography because I can zoom out as much as I need to to get everybody in the shot or I can shoot up to 70 millimeters which is um, more than the 50 millimeter lens and so um, it's just a goal of mine you know so um, each one of those little triangles on on the bullet journal or each one of the little places is a place for me to color in when I can save up twenty dollars toward those items and so um, I feel like that makes it a lot more visual and I'll be putting that money into a separate bank account so it doesn't get touched by groceries and gas and things like that but every time I can save up twenty dollars from a side gig like a mystery shot or things like that um, or when I get my camera fixed I can put away a percentage of the family photo sessions that I do from that into the separate account that will go specifically toward purchasing this camera so or even things like if I want to buy some yarn and I have the money and I decide not to and just say, hey, you know what, that $20 can go toward my camera instead. Put it in a separate account, done. So that is where I am at right now. My hope is to, I'm not going to get that camera before I do um, a, a reopening of my photography business, which is totally fine with me. Um, but I hope to spend the fall building the website, building the portfolio, really integrating a lot of SEO techniques and things like that. And then hopefully do the actual relaunch of my business in the spring, maybe as early as January, February. So, um, so we will see as I develop more of those things, I hope to be able to show you um, a lot more photo techniques, how I did things like build a family session really well where... Um, you know, who goes in the frame first? Who goes in the frame last? It's the kids who go in last, just so you know. Um, but there's just a lot of really fun tips that I have for you guys. And I hope to really get into that a whole lot more. So that's where we're at right now. So keep me in your thoughts as I have goals and I have ways to achieve them. And I so that's pretty much it. But thank you so much for joining me today. I know it was a little bit longer of an episode, but I appreciate you sitting down and hanging out with me for the last hour. And until I see you next time, have a good week. Bye.